how did you feel? You're standing there in this social services car park seven and a half years after this research has started with various ups and downs along the way and the possibilities of this never unfolding in the way that you hope it might. And yet there it is. It's there. The king is there. I mean, how on earth did that make you feel in that moment when you're standing on top of that tarmac and peering into that trench and, and seeing what you're seeing? It was it was overwhelming, but probably not for the reason that you think it was overwhelming, because I kind of braced myself that there was the possibility we could find Richard. But what was utterly overwhelming was that when he was uncovered, they you know, the specialists there said that he looks this is a hunchback because they could see the there was the curve in the spine. And of course, all of the research I'd done on Richard. Um, there was no descriptions of him from his lifetime by people who met him that suggested there was anything abnormal about him. And and I think once we discovered that the grave had been cut too short, so he didn't have kyphosis, which is a forward bend of the spine, but he had a scoliosis, then it kind of made sense because you'll know people with scoliosis, it's a physical condition. It's not a disability. Usain Bolt has scoliosis. So um, then sort of it began to make sense because when Richard had died, there was a comment that somebody said he had one shoulder higher than the other. But I think at the time when he was being uncovered and they said this is a, a hunchback, again, it was Shakespeare looms so large with Richard III that I just thought, I thought we're never going to get past this. How is he, you know, there's, a hunchback, a horrendous word to use, but if he has kyphosis, he couldn't have fought in battle. He couldn't have done all of the things that we actually knew he did. So it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and I think that's why I, I think when you when you look at the documentary and I had to actually sit down because I just thought it doesn't make sense. So it was overwhelming, utterly overwhelming. And then subsequently, of course, um, your role in it, how important was it for you? Because you're approached by Steve Coogan to tell the story um, your way. How how important was it for you? Your your history is as a screenwriter as well. You, you talk about the fact that you, you'd sit down to do that initially. Um, and this had led you to obviously discover more about Richard. What 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 was it about that opportunity that you thought, I we have to do this? We have to tell this this way. Yeah, I must admit, when I met Steve for the first time, in my head, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'll meet him and that will be that and I'll have done that and that's fine, but it's not going to happen. Because, you know, he, he's the comedic genius. So I thought, you know, he's just going to be larking about. It's just going to be a big laugh to him. It's going to be a big joke. That's what I thought I was going to get. But when I met him, he's very, very different person in real life he's incredibly serious and the amount of research that he'd done into the search for Richard the questioning that he did with me and I realized that he's really serious about this but he really knows because he was asking questions about they say this but how does that work and he was really drilling down into the real story behind the scene so I, I began to tell him a little bit and so he was then getting a sense of the real story. And he just said to me, he just said, you know, look, Philip, I like to tell the story of little people who don't have a voice and who don't get to tell their story. Because at this point, you know, um, it was the University of Leicester who had found Richard III. They had led the search for Richard III. That was the story that was everywhere. And so he said, I want to tell your story. I want to give you a voice. And I thought, OK, I'm going to trust him and I'm going to give him everything. And then it's up to him to, for what he does with it. It, it. There's a certain irony, isn't there? And the fact that you're trying to tell Richard's truth and yet your own truth is being written a different way. I think there's a there's a sort of sense of yeah. irony in that. And therefore, you felt the need to, you know, write that wrong and, and address that balance. Yes. Um, I think, again, you don't really see it until you look back. 
But there has been quite a bit of irony on that. And I think still, even today, you, you know, I get denigrated, um, you know, by people saying, oh, she's just an emotional idiot who's in love with Richard III. <laughs> and you just think, really? Seriously? Um, but again, you just, that's why I'm not on social media, because I just, I can't be bothered with it. Good idea. Has it changed you as a person, though, the process and the discovery? It must have done the discovery of Richard III and, and how you've approached everything that's come subsequently. You've now got this Prince's Project as well, and there are other things. So is, is, is it something that you've, what's the biggest lesson, I guess, that you've learned from that process that you've been able to apply subsequently? I think there's two things that I've learned. I think Number one is trust has to be earned. I would give people my trust because they had a powerful name, like they were a professor or a doctor or whatever they were. So I don't do that anymore. And and I think probably since hashtag me too, I now call people out on things straight away. Someone says something to me, I'm like, sorry, what? Um, I don't just smile. I don't ignore it. Um, I don't just let it go. So I think that's probably where I've changed. I'm a bit more ballsy, openly ballsy about things now. Yeah. <laughs> and with regards to taking things further, the Prince's Project, wh where is that at currently? Because obviously the book's out and we've seen the documentary and it's fascinating because lightning, as they say, doesn't always strike twice, but it feels like it is with you. We, 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 you've rewritten history once. Is, is it happening all over again? Yeah, it is. And it's really exciting at the moment because the book is now out. The documentary is great, but we were meant to have two hours for the documentary, but we got quarter of an hour sliced off. And you can just imagine how much information we lost in that quarter of an hour. But the book contains the totality of evidences that we've now uncovered. And so we now know that the princes survived and they went on to fight for the throne against Henry VII. So, yeah, it's really exciting. The project is running live as we speak. We're still going and we are finding more things. So there's going to be more announcements to come. So we'll we'll wait and see with that. We don't know what we're going to do with them, whether there's another documentary or whether I just add some more chapters to the book. But it's really exciting, really exciting. And it must have felt like the most natural progression to take your work from Richard III into The Prince's Project. Was The Prince's Project always something that you'd been fascinated by or, or did, it, did it end up becoming um, that way because of the work on Richard III? Yeah, I was at the reburial for Richard in March 2015 and it was going to be job done that I done what I set out to do and go home, put my feet up, you know, <laughs> start another part of my life. <laughs> but what happened, there was this um, one page article in the Daily Mail newspaper during the reburial week. And, and it ran with a headline of it's mad to make this child killer a national hero. And then it cited that he was a murderer of children. And it gave all the story of how Richard murdered the princes in the tower. But again, there was no evidence. So like Richard being thrown into the River Saw story, it was a later story that had no evidence. So as I was literally getting on the train to go home after we'd reburied Richard III, I already had the Missing Princes project in my mind and thinking I have to start another evidence-based project because this is a huge question. You know, we'll never get to know who the historic Richard III is unless we really do the forensic deep dive into this question finally once and for all so it's not opinion it's looking for evidence and that was that was the big difference can i ask you where you start on a project and if you have <laughs> people who apply themselves to projects normally have timelines in mind um, deadlines in mind. Um, they're thinking of, you know, points along that process where you'll sit and then assess what you've got and go in one direction or the other, depending on, on the results of the findings. What, how, how does it work when you're doing what you do as work? How do you apply yourself in that way? How do you start it? And then how do you measure success along the way? I think with the, the search for Richard, 
once I'd got past that first not giving up, then it was all stations go. And it actually took from the beginning to the end, it was 10 years. So it was a long time for him to, you know, to get to the reburial. So it's 2005 to 2015. And I think when I started the Missing Princes Project, the when I first started looking into what we knew about this story, I think it was so overwhelming the amount of um, stories that I had to look into, potential red herrings that I had mm. to look into, lines of potential lines of investigation, that I said to myself, okay, I've probably got to give this 10 years as well in order to this have some hope of success. So that's where I'm at. I am going to give it 10 years. So we're now, it it was formally launched in 2016. So I'm going to give it to 2026. But at the rate we're going, uh, I think we may be done before 2026. I was going to say, when you but say I'll we're going to give it... If need to. Yeah, but what, is, what are you ultimately looking for? Because you've already, as you say... Um, got evidence to show that the two princes weren't murdered by Richard. They did survive and subsequently um, launched invasions. Uh, uh, what are you looking for? What's the end game with the princes? I think it's just to see what we can find. You know, we've found so much already. And it's just a case of there's so many lines of investigation that are still open. So, you know, once I published the book and did the documentary, there was a moment where I thought, okay, do I just close the lines and wind up? But then I thought, no, I thought, let, let's let see we, where all this takes us. And I'm pleased I did because literally about two or three days ago, I had something come in, so uh, which is really exciting. So I think I'll definitely give it more time. You realise you cannot leave it like that. Two or three days ago, we had something really exciting come in. <laughs> Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to, because <laughs> obviously everything has to be checked. Everything has to be double, triple checked. Um, so, yeah. So obviously I associate you with huge success, but what happens when it doesn't pan out the way that you expect it's going to pan out? Have you had moments where that's that's obviously happened? Absolutely. And when I began the Missing Princes Project, I had to take that on board because the story was so powerful about Richard murdering the princes that I thought, okay, that can be the story. That maybe is what happened. And so I had to come to terms with that because it was about finding the truth, whatever the truth was. And I had to contact, you know, a number of people at the Richard III Society and say, look, I'm going to do this project. I don't know what we're going to find. And they were great. They all said, look, we're a research organization. This is what we do. Whatever you find is going to move our knowledge forward. So that kind of gave me the freedom to then go ahead and mm. to just think, OK, whatever is out there, we're going to find. We're going to look. We're going to search. And the thing that's really special that's depicted in, you know, every account of, of finding Richard III and also in this Prince's Project is there's a, there's a team around you. You're all galvanized. Your team is galvanized, isn't it, to just it, to discover the truth. How important, I mean, in sport and in performance, we always talk about the importance of teamwork for obvious reasons. But how much does it matter in the line of work you're in as well? Because it can be the truth you want to tell, but how important is it to, to, to pull together a crack team that can help you do that? It's really important because I can't, there's no way on, on God's green earth could I do all of this myself. I had to, to ask for, you know, volunteers to join me if they were interested in searching their local archives and that sort of thing, being the boots on the ground, being an army, if you like, a research army. And I've been really lucky, I think, and blessed with the, the people who've been in touch with me because it's the full spectrum. You know, I've got ordinary people who just want to walk into their archive and speak to the archivist and see what they can find. But I've got medieval historians, I've got police, magistrates, advocates, and also um, specialists like um, in, in osteology and, and medieval writing and paleography and um, Latin, all that sort of thing. And 
ancient languages like Old French. So it's been huge because I've got so many specialists that I can call on to help and they give their time freely. Some of them have to charge for the work for sure, um, but most of them give their time freely. And I don't think there's any way a project like this could have been done. I think without the internet, it just was, it's too huge. It was too big because I've got over 300 members around the world. And currently on the supercomputer that I have here at home, I've got over 300,000 files, which I have to be able to check, double check, cross-reference and run searches through. So, yeah, I think a project like this could only have been done now with the connectivity that we have. Amazing. See, these things are often down, aren't they, to a little bit of timing, a little bit of, um, you know, the, the world in which you're living in at the moment. It, it's sort of, it's like the perfect storm for all the right reasons, which is which is good to hear. Philippa, if I could ask you for it, um, people who are listening, watching the podcast, they're really fascinated by the idea that somebody like yourself, the life in which you're living, how, how what makes you tick? What do you do every day? Is there something you do every day that focus, you talk about your laser focus, what do you do to make sure that is in tip top condition? Do you know, it's, it's about quiet time, which probably sounds very odd, doesn't it? Considering it sounds like um, it's, it's a very active thing to be doing in terms of a big research project. But I'm, I'm really lucky. I live, um, I've got an ancient old copse um, at the back of the house. And so I have to give myself downtime, quiet time when everything is switched off, phones are off, everything's off. And, you know, if the weather's good, I sit in the garden and I just listen to the wildlife and become very quiet, very still. Or if the weather's bad, I've got a, um, a big window and I can sit in front of that window and watch the old oak cobs. And that's when I ground myself. And it, it's in those moments, funnily enough, that sometimes a problem that you've had, you know, you, you think is an insolvable one. How can I get here? What can I do with that? Suddenly it will come. Or you'll wake up in the morning and it's in, you know, when you've had sleep as well. And sleep is really important. Again, with chronic fatigue syndrome, it has to be. But it's the quality of sleep. Mm. So it's the hours of sleep that I get before before midnight. Those are the most important hours of sleep for me. So I can go to bed at nine o'clock at night, you know, which probably sounds like you don't have much of a life, Philippa. But sometimes I have to do it and I have to sleep bank a lot. And there has been moments when I've slept for 18 hours nonstop and on one occasion, 24 hours nonstop. Wow. Yeah. But I think you and just have to listen to your body. What did that follow? What had, what had happened leading up to that moment that you, <sighs> that you slept for that length of time? That 24 hours, I can tell you now, that was when I got back from Leicester after we'd found the king and, um, that yeah that that got back home and you know my sons gave me a great big hug and I said look we found him you have to keep it secret I'm sure it's him because of this that and um, they called me king finder and I'm so pleased that they put that in the film which was lovely but my partner John who had his own place then he knew he could see how exhausted I was because I get these dark circles under my eyes and i and he said, you need to sleep, don't you? And I said, yeah. So he said, come on, boys, I'm going to take you to mine for a couple of days. And again, I just literally went to bed and thought I'm going to sleep for a while. And I woke up 24 hours later, <laughs> exhausted. Extraordinary. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well deserved, clearly, evidently. Philippa, it's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much. It's been fascinating. You are, to me, you are the ultimate performance person. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Thank you for having me, Georgia. It's been an honour. Thank you.